Now, according to previous research, South Africa ranks very poorly when it comes to labor relations. And this has been highlighted by the strike at Sabanya Stillwater's gold mines. Last night, Labor Minister Tulas Nlesi blamed the attitudes of the negotiating parties for the failure to resolve the protracted strike by workers affiliated to NUM, the National Union of Mine Workers, and AMCU. Sabanya Stillwater employees have also been camped outside the union building buildings in Pretoria, asking the president to intervene in their almost three-month-long strike. Now, at the same time, the Minister of Mineral Resources and Energy, uh, Gwede Matashe, has uh, threatened that uh, there is a growing tendency by mining executives uh, to insult the state, and that could be detrimental to the resource sector. Let's discuss. So we're now joined by author Terry Bell, who specializes in labor matters. Uh, Mr. Bell, great to have you with us. Thank you. Uh, firstly, let's start with this specific strike at Sabanya Stillwater. Are you, are you hopeful of a breakthrough? Government has now got involved and it's moved to the CCMA today, uh, but still no news. Uh, how are you feeling looking at the dynamics here? It should have gone to the CCMA long before this. I, I quite honestly don't understand why it has dragged on so long. They keep talking about attitudes on both sides. There are always attitudes on both sides. The employer very simply has always to guarantee maximum profitability. And that means the greatest amount of, if you wish, exploitation of the costs. And one of the costs, of course, is labor. So you're always going to have that. In this particular instance, you also have a situation of a commodities boom, which has been going on for some time now. I mean, a long time, actually, since I would say about 1974, 75, um, which has continued to boom and given an incredible amount of profits to gold and particularly platinum group metals miners. And the miners have got, I think, legitimately rather annoyed about not getting a fair share of what is an extraordinary amount of profitability. Yeah. So that's we're dealing with that, actually. At the same time, we're dealing with a massive amount of unemployment in a country here where we have a situation where sociologists have been telling us for years that the average person in employment at a lower level uh, supports up to 10 dependents. I would say, given the amount of unemployment that's increased in the last couple of years, they probably support even more, maybe 12 or 15 dependents. Isn't there a lot of scope because of that commodities boom for Sabanya Stillwater to show some goodwill here? I mean, the executive pay has been in the press. The shareholder schemes were, were seen as the third way where, where workers anyway could get involved in those profits so it wouldn't only be be big payoffs for executives. Uh, do you think that the company may have been short-sighted here? Well, you see, the point is, and they've come back on the argument that the amount of 300 billion <laughs> million rand, which is an awful lot to be paid to one individual, but it's over a period of 10 years, and that most of it was in share options, that if the shares went up, he got the money. If they didn't, he wouldn't have got it. And they say, well, we could give in shares to the, the workers. That's not the point. We might actually have to start an argument here that since South Africa contains possibly 60 to 70 percent, well, in this region anyhow, of uh, the world's resources of platinum group metals, which are needed, which are desperately needed into the 21st century, uh, perhaps the government should set up, mind you, with the degree of corruption is a problem, but what one should have perhaps is a board which actually sets a price on these things. And when the, go when the commodities price rises beyond that, that goes into a fund which supports when the commodities price falls, which it will do. It will fall again yeah. at some stage. So that's the point. We, I think we need to look beyond this business of Let's grab what we can now and look at how we can sustain the situation in the longer term. I mean, Sabanya Stillwater even says uh, it's, it's warned workers that they've already lost at least 32,000 rand each. And cumulatively, they've lost 1 billion rand. I mean, why not use that 1 billion to augment their, their wage offer? Or, or is, it, is that simplistic? No, the point is also one should never forget 
that companies, mining companies in particular, always keep stockpiles. So what happens is when you have a strike, they can quite happily start to continue sell out onto the stockpiles and continue to make the profit, while workers who are on strike are not being paid. It's actually a very profitable situation for the employer. Um, and, but when the strike goes on for longer, as it has now, three months, it could go on even longer, then everyone starts to be damaged. And I think that's what perhaps some of the union uh, thinkers are, are deciding. Well, let's hang on there because we'll start to hurt them and not just us. However, along the line, we have to look at what that actually means to the dependents of those mine workers. And it's, it's quite tragic. We're, we're in a situation now where already 27% of our children under the age of five are, are stunted. Yeah. What, what about government's involvement here? Um, looking at those workers uh, outside the union buildings, I would think the president has to be careful because if government gets involved, it would have to get involved in every labor dispute. However, there, there is something bigger going on. Then we saw the Labour Minister saying that the attitudes were wrong. We've also seen the Minerals Minister, Gwede Mantashe, um, suggesting that he may cancel the mining rights of Sibanya Stillwater if they want, don't want to use those rights. That was after Froneman, the CEO, said that the strike could go on um, for years. Sibanya Stillwater could handle that. And he's also said that we're basically in a failed state. So the, the minister uh, seemingly hitting back saying we don't like executives who insult the state. Uh, does, does government have to be really careful here or should it use its power and say, if you're not going to treat workers correctly, actually we can start looking at the fine print of the mining charter and, and seeing what you're doing um, across a range of issues? Well, the thing here is, I mean, I think really Montage was probably out of order. He should not have been saying that sort of thing. You step in and you merely pour fuel onto the fire. Um, he should not have been doing that. We should have been talking to one another and talking to the unions and leaving it to the CCMA, but not, you know, beginning to threaten. I mean, I, I, one could argue that, yes, the companies make more profits and they don't bother about the government and they, you know, but you don't turn around. That's, that's quite insulting at this sort of level. At the same time, the workers are saying, well, this is ridiculous. Why should we have to be paid? If you look at it in terms of international payments, looking at the, the exchange rates, etc., workers in South Africa are not very highly paid when you look at what they do, and I'm talking about mining specifically, and, and how much profit they generate. For people who sit in New York or Lausanne or wherever, uh, drawing the dividends out of their work. So, you know, it's, it's, it's a very complicated problem. And the worst thing politicians can do is sort of run off at the mouth. And I think that's, yeah. you know, it, it just inflames the situation. Final quick question. Um, in, in the run-up to Marikana, uh, one of the things that was blamed was competition for members between the NUM and AMCU. They're, they're now actually standing together. Uh, could that be a game changer this time, that, that they're standing side by side, uh, wanting the same thing and, and facing this company head on? Well, the first thing is that Marikana was not a competition between AMCU and NUM. The miners at, um, at Marikana were all NUM members. They rebelled against their own shop stewards who were paid by the mining company. At the same time, the president of the, of the union, of the National Union of Mine Workers, was paid by the mining company as a president. And they went and said, we want to talk democratically from the work shop floor, so to speak. Well, if one calls it a shop floor, the mining tunnels or whatever, uh, the point is that they rebelled against their own union, which was being used, I would argue, by Lonro as effective line management for the company. And then Amku came in from another pit to support them, and that's where the division came about. It was not a, a fight between Amku and NUM. It was a fight between ordinary members of NUM and their own bureaucracy. Yeah. So, so very quickly, them standing together this time, could it be a game changer? I don't know if it's a game changer. I think it's, it's I'm a bit optimistic about it. 
I'd like, you know, it would be very good if they could all come together. And one would hope that the old axes have, have be, have will be buried. But um, at this stage, it's optimistic from a labor point of view and a trade union point of view that AMCU and NUM have come together. It's actually a good sign for the future. All right. Thank you very much, Labor Analyst Terry Bell. And of course, we'll continue to follow what happens with the strike. Um, very protracted. And as we're discussing, um, hard line stances from all the players, government involved as well.